everyone, Corey here. I'm joined with my husband, Matlock, today, and you have landed on the weekly recap. So uh, this is re recapping our Bible discovery reading from January 23rd to 29th, and that takes us from Exodus chapter 22 all the way to Leviticus chapter eight. I just wanna to mention too, this year, we're doing a little bit of a different format. Obviously, we're here in the Bible Discovery Studios and I'm joined by Matt Walk, my husband. Uh, last year, it was just me and you one-on-one. -on -one. And if you prefer that format, because I know there's some of you that do, Always remember, it's the, the link to a video where I'm recapping and it's just me and you is in the description box. So if that's you, check in the description box. If not, welcome to this week's recap. We're going to jump right into anything you want to say first, Matt? No, we're good. I think you pretty much covered it all. So <laughs> okay, let's good. just jump into it. All right. Okay, so Exodus. Exodus is a really interesting biblical book. Here in Exodus chapter 22, we are near the beginning of God revealing the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. So we've already got the Ten Commandments. That was on last week's recap. So uh, here we are in Exodus, Levit Exodus, <laughs> Exodus Leviticus. I, this is going to be a good one, guys. <laughs> Exodus 22. It talks about property issues mainly. So uh, things like theft and arson or fire damage, uh, things like this, anything that could happen to your personal property uh, and, and what to do about it in Israelite society. There's also rules about social responsibility. So it basically lists inappropriate behaviors and what to do when these behaviors happen. So this is about you know, controlling or, or um, attempting to dissuade people from doing unacceptable behaviors. Uh, for example, an unwed couple sleeping together, that, that was to be an inappropriate thing that wasn't supposed to happen in ancient Israel. So what do you do if it does happen? Things like sorcery, bestiality, uh, the mistreatment of foreigners among Israel, that was not acceptable either. So really we see these rules being made to help society avoid that behavior in the first place. But if it does happen, what to do? Exodus chapter 23, this is more social laws. And uh, interestingly, many of these laws constitute what we would think of today because our Western society is largely built mm. upon, you know, Judeo-Christian values that stem uh, from these rules of God, these laws of God. Uh, so what we would think of today as being a good or a moral person, things like don't lie, don't follow the crowd when they're doing evil. So just because everyone's doing it doesn't mean you should do it. Still judge things based off their morality. Help your enemies if it's in your power to help your enemies, you need to do that. Uh, and don't accept bribes. So things like this, social laws. Um, there's also Sabbath laws in Exodus chapter 23. Uh, and, and this means not only taking a, a day of rest each week for uh, the individual. Remember, this is ancient Israel. So the individual and their entire household. So their workers, their servants, their children, everyone in the house got a, a day of rest. But also every seventh year, they were to allow their land to lay fallow, to not uh, plant their vineyards or plant out their crops, but to also give the land a rest, which is really interesting, especially when you do agricultural studies. It's interesting also to look at that. Also because God calls it his land. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Which is, yeah, a later theme, but continue, sorry. It is, it is. Okay. And obviously this is looking forward to the time when they would be in the promised land mm -hmm. because Israel at this moment is still in the wilderness. Okay, so it also talks about here in Exodus 23, the three annual festivals that were to always happen in Israel. So this is the festival of unleavened bread, which is essentially a celebration of the Exodus. They're to eat unleavened bread because when Israel was leaving Egypt, they didn't have enough time to wait for their bread to be leavened. So this is celebrating the Exodus. Then they're supposed to celebrate um, a feast of harvest, or it's also called first fruits, uh, which is the early crops mm. of the land. So they they harvested it a couple different times of year. And then the third festival was the festival of ingathering, which is late crops. Mm -hmm. So the crops that come later. So basically a celebration to God for his provision, not only of the land, but also of that year's particular crops. Um, then we're told that God... Still in Exodus 23. Still in Exodus. I know there's a lot. There's a lot in, in some of these chapters. So 
God encourages them and encourages Moses to be faithful because God is sending an angel ahead of them into the promised land, into Canaan, to prepare the way for them. So this is going to come into play later on Mm -hmm. where this is an important element where God is asking the people and he's asking Moses specifically to trust him and to stay faithful because it's going to look like, you get the hint here, it's going to look like there's no way. Right. But I'm sending an angel into the promised land ahead of you to prepare a way, mm-hmm. right? So they, you get this idea, they, they wouldn't just normally be able to go in and take it over. There's something um, more than natural. Yeah, right. That's going to be going on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, Exodus 24, finally, <laughs> we made yeah. it to the next chapter. Um, in this chapter, Moses is told to write, we're told actually that Moses wrote down everything that God said. So this also helps us with with the concept that that Moses is writing great chunks of of the Bible at this point. Yes, it was edited later, but we get from the text itself that Moses was writing things down. Um, And uh, he reads it to the people uh, and the people agree to this law. Right. Uh, Right. Then the next day uh, after this whole agreement happens, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel actually go up Mount Sinai and Moses approaches God. And we're told that all of the elders plus Aaron and his sons see God and they eat and drink in God's presence. Uh, Then Moses and Joshua get called up Mount Sinai once again to get the stone tablets of the law. And we learned that from the Israelites' perspective, who were not up on the mountain, the cloud of God on Mount Sinai looked to them like a consuming fire. And then Moses was up there for 40 days. Mm -hmm. So this is setting us up for what will become their apostasy. Uh, Something of interest, too, here is that it refers to something called the Book of the Covenant, which is something that really— Right. Some scholars think— and that's Exodus 24, verse 7. Some scholars think that that's actually referring to— Exodus 20, verses 22, to Exodus 23, verse uh, 33. Right. Just that small little snippet. because the law you, code. Right, because at, at Exodus yeah. 20, verse 21, if you just stop right there, then start at chapter 24, mm-hmm. it kind of reads very smooth. Mm-hmm. So they, they think that later on that was just added there because it was a perfect fit to kind of add the law, mm-hmm. it was, but it was simply like put in there at a later date mm-hmm. uh, to kind of fulfill the whole thing. But that's, I, don't know, I thought that was an interesting point to make there. Yeah. It's not because the book of the covenant is not just like the whole thing yeah. possibly. Anyways. Yeah, no, it, it definitely is interesting because we, we swing in and out from law that God is giving Moses mm-hmm. and that Moses wrote down and then narrative. Right. right? Like what's going on? What's it's happening? Back, so like Moses yeah. got this and then he came down and then he wrote it down and then the elders. Right. So we're going between the law code and the narrative, like what's actually happening in the real world. So definitely, you know, this this definitely was put together after the fact. Like at, Moses is probably not writing and now God called us up to the mountain. So up we go. It's <laughs> right, not written right, yeah. in like present tense. Yeah. It's written in here's what happened. Right. So it's interesting when when you're able to kind of look at it and divide it that way. Yeah, it's yeah, it's very good. Okay, Exodus chapter 25. So this has to do with the offerings of materials that are going to be needed to build the tent tabernacle. So God's speaking to Moses again, and um, we're told that they're going to need things like yarn, linen, goat hair, and leather, and all of these things that they're going to need to build a sacred tent. He gets the instructions for the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the showbread table, and the lampstand. So articles that are going to be in the tent tabernacle and later the temple as well. Exodus chapter 26, we're told of uh, how the tabernacle should be constructed. So Moses gets the pattern, the blueprint for the tabernacle. We're told that there's going to be 10 woven linen curtains and they're woven with a cherubim pattern in blue, purple, and scarlet. And they're going to be held together with golden clasps. The next layer is 11 curtains of goat skins held together with bronze clips. And then the next layer is ram skins dyed red. And then the next layer, there's, it's very layered, you know, which probably symbolized the holiness of the tabernacle. It's so separate from everyday life. It's so sacred. It's so holy. The next layer is 
a little bit of a mystery. It's called durable leather in most English translations. Some English translations, you know, they don't really know what to do with this word because we're not exactly sure what it means. It's some sort of leather, probably. Some say badger, a porpoise or dolphin, a dugong or sea cow, seal, or just fine leather. I, fine leather. I love the New American Bible because they just give up and they just transliterate the word. <laughs> They're like, tahash. <laughs> yeah. The next layer is tahash yeah. because there's a similar Arabic word uh, that designates an aquatic animal, mm. the skin of a, so probably the skin of an aquatic animal, which is where that whole porpoise thing comes from or, or sea cow. And then there's a similar Akkadian word that designates beaded leather. So like decorated leather. So no one really knows quite sure. But but basically the tabernacle is going to be a tent built over frames made of wood that were overlaid with gold. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exodus chapter 27, we get the instructions for the altar of burnt offering, uh, which is wood overlaid with bronze and it's horned as well. Uh, which is a very common motif in the ancient Near East, the horns representing power. Uh, the Bible just picks up on this symbolism. You know, when we get into Psalms, we see it very prominently where a horn um, is it literally equates to someone's power. Uh, okay, also utensils, curtains, and frames uh, for the courtyard around the tabernacle. All of these instructions are given. And also we're told that the very best olive oil, like the primo olive oil, <laughs> had to go uh, to the tabernacle to keep the lamps going at all mm. times. Uh, Exodus 28. Okay, here Moses receives the instructions for the priestly clothing. There's a tabernacle, so there needs to be priests to, mm. you know, Conduct all the goings on <laughs> yeah, right. in the tabernacle. Okay, so their clothes are made largely of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn along with fine linen. We're told that, we're, uh, that they're to have an ephod, which is essentially embroidered linen that has special shoulder pieces with 12 stones engraved with the names of of the tribes of Israel on them. Mm -hmm. um, there's a breast piece, which is also embroidered linen, but the breast piece is essentially a square pocket. And on the outside, it has 12 stones with the 12 tribes of Israel uh, carved, like the names carved on, on the stones. And um, it this breast piece attaches to the ephod's shoulders with gold chains. Uh, and it's attached to the waistband of the ephod with a blue cord. So it goes very specific. And inside this breast piece goes the Urim and Thummim. Which is interesting in itself. But oh specifically, uh, yeah. chapter 28 mm -hmm. is full of so much messianic and salvation typology. Mm -hmm. It's insane. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, compared to the other ones, I should say. But, yeah. but not as like, you know, let's say the New Testament. But so, for example, even the high priest garments, right? they match the inside of the tabernacle. It's like when you're in the tabernacle itself is just made of skin. The inside is made of this beautiful, like gold, scarlet, like this blue linen, everything about yeah, it's embroidered. Like, right. Everything's of the, the, the finest artistry and the, like the highest value possible. Mm -hmm. It's on the inside. And that's what the priests look like. So, mm -hmm. when, so when they're inside, they come out. It's like a piece of holiness from the inside. It's coming outside. But what's really interesting too about this is that when you look at like when Jesus Christ coming and he's just in the flesh, he just looks like a normal person. But the inside is what makes them holy. But this this is almost not quite, the, this is like the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. for how this goes. Um, the high priest uh, specifically, like you were saying, the clothing, he wore all white linen completely down, right? Mm -hmm. From his, his robe, his turban. Then on top, he wore an ephod with the name of each person. Uh, each tribe yep. listed on each stone, and then he had the six, you know, the six tribes listed, and the six tribes listed. Yeah, on one stone each on his right. shoulder. Yeah. So he would always go before the presence of the Lord, mm -hmm. and essentially this breastplate of judgment. Uh, I'm going to read you a verse that you know that shows what I'm saying here. The breastplate of judgment here bears or covers the sin of the people. Mm -hmm. The priest himself wasn't good enough to stand before the people. He required to wear the garment in order for uh, the sin and the guilt of the people to be laid on the garment itself. I'll read it. Verse, Exodus 28, verse 43. Aaron and his sons must wear them, the, the ephod, whenever they enter the tent of meeting or tent of dwelling, or approach the altar to minister in the holy place, so that they will not incur guilt and die. 
The garments cover or bear the guilt and sin, not the high priest. The priest himself is not good enough. So this is what's amazing about mm-hmm. this is that like you have this idea of substitute, of a substitution in the clothing of the of the priest because the priest himself isn't isn't holy. And so we have this idea happening too in, not to go too much of a tangent because I know I'm, I'm pretty much ranting here, but in Romans 13, 14, when Paul says, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 53 to 40, uh, 54, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. The high, the high priest's garments, we know in Hebrews, it always talks about mm-hmm. uh, Christ is our high priest, right? And he entered the sanctuary made with human hands, not of made of human hands, uh, but that was a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us before God's presence. Long story short, all of this tabernacle imagery and symbolism with the garments and its high value is messianic typology and salvation typology because it's solidified on the day of atonement, mm-hmm. which we're going to get into. He takes off his ephod, which bears the guilt, and he stands only in white linen, white as snow, before God. All of his sins are forgiven. Mm-hmm. That summarizes the whole thing. So it's just parallel. Though. Anyways, I, yeah, I ranted very... for too long. No, Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. There is very rich symbolism when it comes to clothing and this idea of clothing and how how you stand in the presence of God. Right. You know, Zechariah picks up on it. And then like you're saying uh, with with Paul, uh, it's really interesting. We could talk forever about yeah, it, honestly. There's, there's no time. There's no time. No. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, not, it's not that bad. We're yeah. not totally out of time. <laughs> I wanted to mention too um, that the hem of the uh, high priest's robe uh, was decorated with golden bells and pomegranates all around the edge of it so that the sound of him would be heard as he walked in the Holy of Holies. Um, he also was to wear a linen turban mm. with on the turban there was a, a golden plate um, that said holy to the Lord on his turban and then for the other priests they were to wear linen tunics and caps with embroidered sashes so they didn't get quite as fancy as, <laughs> as, the, as the high priest um, and then they all had to wear special linen undergarments mm. uh, to from basically from their waist to their thigh we're right. told in, in the Bible Okay, so uh, essentially, so Aaron, his layers, he wore many layers as the high priest. So he would have his linen undies, essentially, then his tunic, (laughs) then his robe, then the ephod, then the breast piece, then the turban. Mm. So lots of lots of steps for Aaron for good reason. (laughs) Okay, Exodus chapter 29. This was all about how to consecrate or dedicate the priests for service. Essentially, it involved an animal and a grain offering, a sacrifice, to wash them, then to dress Aaron specifically as the high priest and anoint him with oil by pouring it on his head. And then Moses was to bring Aaron's sons, the other priests, and dress them. And we're also told that when Aaron died, he was to pass on the clothes of the high priest to the next high priest. The clothes were to be passed down. Exodus chapter 30, we're told, um, Uh, how um, Moses got the instructions for building the altar of incense, which again is wood covered in gold, and how they were to burn incense twice a day, offer incense to God. Uh, Moses is told that um, whenever a census would be taken of Israel, each Israelite man aged 20 and older must pay a ransom to the tabernacle for his life uh, of half a shekel. So, you know, Basically, there's a tax when, whenever you do a census. Then we're told that the bronze basin that would be constructed for washing the priest's hands and feet when they were working in the tabernacle, we're given the instructions for making the special anointing oil and also um, a special incense recipe that was only ever, these two things were only ever to be used in the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 31, we're told that uh, two men named Bezalel and Aholiab were chosen to be the head craftsmen for this tabernacle project. So these Israelite men who were raised in Egypt are now responsible for carrying out this tabernacle. Uh, We're told then that Moses receives the stone tablets from God. Exodus chapter 32 this is where things take a very dark turn. <laughs> yeah. Very dark turn. Uh, this is the incident of the golden calf. So you know the story. Uh, Moses 
comes down from the mountain. He's finally received the tablets of the law. He's walking down um, and Joshua joins him and they hear, Joshua's like, I hear the sound of celebrating in the camp and most mm, turns out to, to, to be very bad. And the people have begun worshiping a golden calf. They've gotten Aaron to make them a golden calf. They believe that Moses and Joshua have been killed by God on the mountain because they've been gone for so long. Um, long story short, the Levites end up siding with Moses and with God, and they actually march through the camp and they kill the Israelites who led the community in this sin, who were all for the worshiping of this golden calf. So we also learn that Aaron must have made the calf, right. but not worshiped it because, uh, well, he survived. Yeah. But also he does seem to have, he, he's a very weird excuse. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't me. I just pop, put all the gold into the fire and it popped out. Now you, you told me like us modern readers, you read it and you're like, oh, it just sounds like he's like appealing to magic. Like, oh, it just, like what a, just what a weird lie. But you told me that this is not the case. So what did you find out about this? Yeah. So there is a Mesopotamian tradition uh, that talks about um, uh, specifically in, in very, like old Babylon. Uh, when they would create an idol, there was a whole ceremony that they would do where the crafters of the idol would would ceremonially like chop off their hands. Like they wouldn't actually chop off their hands. They just pretended to chop off their hands and there was a sacrifice involved and basically renounced that they created it and instead attributed the creation to the, their, the creator gods, like the gods that crafted right. idols in their mythology. Right. Um, and and thus did not accept glory on their own. So mo so Aaron may have been appealing to this this cultural phenomena where he's like, look, it's it's really the the it's really the calf god that did this. Like I was just the vessel. Right. I take no responsibility for this. Now, regardless, a lot of people get upset. I've I've answered a lot of questions about this. Actually, a lot of people get upset that that Aaron wasn't held culpable for this because other people were right. Other people died right. for this. Uh, and we learn in Deuteronomy when you keep reading in Deut Deuteronomy nine verse twenty, uh, Moses is speaking and and he's talking about how God did want to kill Aaron as well. As, as part of this, but Moses intervened and prayed for Aaron, and so he was spared. Hmm. Take with that what you will. But <laughs> yeah. Deuteronomy 9.20 says that. Is it fair? I don't get to decide. It, it just, it, it is what happened. Right. So well, it's interesting that he tried to appeal to, a, to what seems to have been a common mythology. No, yeah, it, it, that makes way more sense than it just being magic. Than him just being yeah. like, he'll buy this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moses will buy the best, this. The, best li the worst liar there is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Exodus chapter 33. I mean, that's why he wanted him around. Anyways, <laughs> you can always tell if he's telling the truth or not. Yeah, just Anyways. a terrible, terrible liar. It's <laughs> yeah. a good high priest. You, yeah. want a, you want a high priest who can't lie well. <laughs> it's good news. Okay, um, so it's... Really, Exodus chapter 33 uh, has to do with, with a tent of meeting being established uh, between uh, Moses and God, because this is one of the repercussions for the whole golden calf incident. Um, essentially, God is very, obviously, he's very upset. And he's like, you go to the promised land, but I'm not coming with you. And that doesn't fly, right? There's a lot of repentance that goes on. But this eventually, this leads to the creation of the tent of meeting outside of the camp of Israel, where Moses would go to the tent of meeting, Joshua would go to the tent of meeting and meet with the presence of God. And eventually, when the tent tabernacle was constructed, this was just incorporated into the tent tabernacle, because then the presence of God would meet with Israel there. But it's interesting to look at. I Exodus chapter 34, Moses chisels out new stone tablets because he he broke them when he saw the Israelites engaging in idol worship. So he chisels out new stone tablets, goes back up Mount Sinai, sees God's glory, asks for God to still go with Israel. And there's an abridged version of the law uh, that's given and Moses writes it on the tablets. And when he comes back down the mountain, his face is glowing, glowing from the presence of God. Exodus chapter 35 and 36, I'm going to combine them. Uh, the Sabbath is reiterated. Uh, people uh, offer, so they tithe, they give materials to make the tent tabernacle. 
and of and their time to help construct it. And uh, Bezalel and Holiab are officially put in charge and they begin work on the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 37, we see uh, many things built. The ark, the showbread table, the lampstand, and the altar of incense are all built in Exodus 37. In Exodus 38, the building is continued. This time, the altar of burnt offering, the washing basin, the courtyard curtains and the frames so that the outside structure around the tent tabernacle are built and were given an amount of materials that were used, total materials that were used in that construction. Exodus chapter 39, this is the making of the priest's outfit. So the ephod, the breast piece, all of these things. And then Moses goes through and inspects the tent tabernacle and he bless, he gives a blessing on all of the workers right. that worked on it. Exodus chapter 40, this is going to end Exodus for us. Uh, the Israelites set up the tent tabernacle, anoint the tent tabernacle, consecrate the priests, and then the cloud associated with the presence of God on the mountain mm -hmm. and also at the tent of meeting filled the tabernacle. Uh, so the Bible then tells us that this cloud would lift off the tabernacle. And when it did that, the Israelites would know that it was time for them to move camp. So they would pack everything up, pack, pack themselves up, pack the tent tabernacle up. Um, and we're told that at nighttime, that cloud looked like a fire. Uh, and, and it's interesting also to note that the cloud, this presence of God, mm. represented, uh, the was the fulfillment of Moses' request to God back in chapter 34, where he's like, please go with us. Remember when God was yeah. like, you can go, but I'm not going. And the Moses is like, no, 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 please, please go yeah. with us. We can't do this without you. And so, and so this represents the fulfillment of that. They, they followed the law, they followed all the instructions right. and God honored them following the instructions. Now, before we cap off Exodus completely, mm -hmm. um, you told me before this started that you found some sort of archaeological evidence of a sacred space on Shiloh. Oh, that's right. right. So just before we go to Leviticus, and like, well, I didn't find everyone. it. Yeah. I didn't find oh, it. Oh, yeah. I so, wish yeah. I found it. No. You found the article. <laughs> I you am found... not an archaeologist <laughs> by trade. Yeah. You excavated the article from the, I excavated it myself. Yeah, the trenches no. of online. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no. There's been some really interesting scholarly articles that have been written about this. So Shiloh, when we get into Joshua, we're going to see that when the Israelites go into the promised land during the time of Joshua, they set up the tent tabernacle at the city of Shiloh. Uh, and it, um, we get intimation from the Bible that they build structures around the tent tabernacle. For example, the high priest Eli is said to be sitting in the gate of the tent tabernacle, but tents don't have gates. So a gate structure would probably mean that there was a wall that was built around the tent tabernacle, right. more permanent installations, like appropriate for right. now that they're in the promised land. And at in excavations at Shiloh today, they have found a sacred area. It's really the only big enough area where the tent tabernacle with the dimensions that the Bible gives would have been able to be established. And what they found is in the bedrock of this very flat area were are carved poles measuring the distance of the tent tabernacle. Mm. So it appears that they dug out into the bedrock holes for the bases of the tent poles. That's huge. It's really cool. And yeah. it measures to exactly what the Bible says the tent tabernacle measured oh, to. Oh, that's awesome. And there's a structure. Like there is a there is a, a, a what, what archaeologists would refer to as like a cultic center, like a right. cultic structure built around it, like a wall and a gate complex. So not a whole lot is left, but this gives significant evidence for not only the biblical – uh, dimensions of the tabernacle, right. but also that the early history of of the conquest happened. Yeah, exactly. And Joshua and the Judges. As opposed to it being invented by some guy, mm -hmm. you know, in the time of the Babylonian exile. <laughs> That's oh, a, yeah, anyway, sorry. Don't get me started. Uh, I won't. Right. Don't get me started. But yeah, it's very cool that evidence for the dimensions of the tabernacle does exist. Yeah. Uh, where That's awesome. It's so profound that it would exist, actually. Mm -hmm. That's amazing mm -hmm. that it would retain like that. Yeah. All right, that's cool. Okay, Leviticus. We're going to do the first eight chapters of Leviticus to finish off this week. Leviticus 1. This is instructions for the offerings of Israel, specifically the burnt offerings. So we're told that 
Uh, this can be from the herd or flock. So sheep or goats, it needed to be for burnt offering, it needed to be a male animal without defect or a bird, a dove or a young pigeon. So this would be- If you had um, less money. If you had less money, right? right? Because flock and herd animals were more expensive. And that as a burnt offering, it needed to be completely burnt up. You didn't keep any part of this offering. It was completely given to God. Leviticus chapter 2 talks all about the grain offerings. And essentially, it's always some combination of fine flour, which just took longer to grind. So ancient people in the Near East would generally grind their flour daily as they needed it. Mm -hmm. And then the amount that you sifted it and what type of grain you were grinding determined whether it was fine flour or common flour. So this was fine flour and olive oil mixed into various forms. Uh, And essentially a portion of the grain offering was offered to God and burnt. And then the rest of the grain offering was given to the priests and their family as their flour, as their food. Leviticus chapter 3 talks about fellowship offerings. Now, these are animal sacrifices. So it was in either or male or female, didn't matter. The flock or herd, so goat or sheep, essentially. And the fat, the blood, and the organs of the slaughtered animal would be burnt up, and the rest of the butchered animal would be eaten by the offerers. Okay. Leviticus chapter 4. Four and five, I'm grouping together because they talk about the sin offering and the guilt offering. So if a priest were to sin, they needed to offer a young bull as a burnt offering. Mm. If the whole community sins, another young bull needs to be offered. If a leader of the community sins, it it could be a male goat. If a member of the community, a female goat or lamb, And anyone who couldn't, who needed to offer a sin offering, but they couldn't afford a goat or a lamb could bring two doves or two young pigeons. And if they, if they couldn't even afford that, they could bring fine flour to offer. They didn't need any olive oil or incense to go with that. It could just be the flour. Right. Uh, In the guilt offering was for uh, sin, When they sinned unintentionally against the holy things, they needed to offer a ram and money to the tabernacle. And if you broke the law of God unintentionally, rather than a sin offering, it was a guilt offering and it was a ram. Mm. Okay. Uh, Leviticus chapter 6. This has to do with what happens if you steal or if you mislead someone that leads to the loss of their property. Uh, you must, if you steal something, you have to return it. Uh, Or if you don't no longer have it, like if you sold it or if you broke it, you have to make full restitution. So you have to pay what it's worth plus a fifth of the value. And then also present a guilt offering to the priest. Mm -hmm. So not just a sin offering, a guilt offering to the priest. There's regulations to the priest about burnt offerings, grain offerings, and sin offerings also here in Leviticus chapter six. Right. So Leviticus is, if you haven't, if you couldn't tell already just by what we're talking about, it's all about uh, the procedures related to the sacrifices right. for the Levites. Like how are you going to make this yeah. functionally It's for work? everyone, but primarily purposed for the Levites. Yeah. yeah, right. Like they're in the tabernacle, they're the ones having to do the sacrifices. Right. So what are all the little tiny rules going on. Okay, Leviticus chapter 7 talks about the guilt offering, the fellowship offering again, and the priest's share of the offerings. So how does that work? What parts do the priests get to have? What are the rules around that? That's all in Leviticus chapter 7. And finally, our last chapter for today, Leviticus chapter 8. This is a longer record of the ordination of Aaron and his sons that we've already read about back in Exodus. So this is the ceremony that that they went through and also the sacrifices that were offered on their behalf. Awesome. And that's it. That is it. That's it. All right. So Exodus chapter 22 to Leviticus 8. If you have any questions or comments about the reading today, please pop them in the comments down below and Matlock and I will get back to you throughout the week. I hope you're having a really good time. I hope you're staying on top of your reading and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for watching. 
We want to keep producing high quality biblical content, but we can't do it without your support. If you feel called to support us, please click the link in the description under donate. Your support really means a lot to us.